All right. Hi there. So my name is Emma. I'm from the UNOVA Center. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Before we dive into our discussion on how to prepare for menopause, for those of you who are new to either Electra Health or UNOVA, I wanted to let you know a bit more about these centers and places, as well as a bit more about our speakers. So Electra Health is on a mission to smash the menopause taboo by empowering women with evidence-based education, care, and community. Their platform, rooted in evidence and integrative wellness, has been made accessible through technology. Their team is made up of a, a board-certified physicians, best-in-class technologists, and advisors from the nation's leading medical institutions and women's brands. Together, they're building a movement to bring menopause into the 21st century. The UNOVA Center is a leading Chinese medicine practice acclaimed for its expertise in reproductive health. Working in partnership with patients, we are dedicated to providing integrative care um, with meaningful results. As of recently, we've moved part of our practice online and have been offering virtual consultations to support our patients, and we've reopened our clinical doors and are available for in-clinic acupuncture as well. Dr. Elizabeth Poiner, who is a provider for Electra Health, is a gynecologic oncologist and advanced pelvic surgeon with over 20 years of experience. She was previously the Director of Translational Research for the Gynecology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Today, she specializes in menopause, sexual health, and quality of life issues related to menopause in, the can in cancer survivors. And then we have Dr. Jill Blakeway, who is an acupuncturist and herbalist, as well as the founder of Unova, where she's been treating patients for over two decades. Jill has always been passionate about supporting people's reproductive health and credits much of her success to combining the ancient wisdom of Chinese medicine with modern conventional biomedicine. I know many of you have sent over questions prior to this discussion, which we're looking forward to diving into and answering. You can also feel free to submit questions throughout the discussion and I'll read them out loud for you. And with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Dr. Pointer and Dr. Blakeway to get started. Well, thank you, Emma. That was a lovely introduction. I have to tell you, thank you all for coming. I can see you building up <laughs> out, um, uh, there watching. Um, I have to tell you that Dr. Poyner is one of my favorite doctors. Um, uh, and I say this behind her back too. You'll, <laughs> you'll be glad to hear. Um, uh, she's a very unusual combination of oncologist, gynecologist, surgeon, and she's also um, qualified in functional medicine. And so she has an understanding of alternative medicine, but she an oncologist and I think these things are very important when we talk about menopause where we have had situations where women in the past were prescribed drugs that ended up creating breast cancer and exacerbating breast cancer so I trust her on the subject of how to manage menopause um, she's my doctor so that tells you everything doesn't it I trust her to manage me so welcome Elizabeth <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Well, I wanted to start, I know Emma has a question in a minute, but I, I was just telling um, you before we went live, um, one of the biggest sources of confusion amongst women when it comes to menopause is the difference between using herbs to manage your menopause, bioidentical hormones and what they actually are, and then hormone replacement therapy and pharmaceutical hormones. And I wondered if we could just launch right in. What was that question that you had from Instagram, Emma? Yes, so um, someone was wondering if you could explain the use of hormone replacement therapy and if there are any alternatives, what those would be. So hormone replacement therapy is generally prescribed for a woman um, when, as her estrogen is tapering off and progesterone is tapering off to, to support estrogen and also progesterone in the body. And um, we typically prescribe hormone replacement therapy for women who are having very severe symptoms of menopause who have been maybe refract or perimenopause also because now there's a movement to talk about hormone replacement therapy as women begin to transition through menopause and as the hormone balance uh, begins to change. Many times we, pre we prescribe hormone replacement therapy or supportive therapy for women who are having significant symptoms such as hot flashes, mood issues, even bone loss. Um, but we, we will many times talk about significant hormone replacement therapy when maybe more natural therapies have failed or, or are more significant um, uh, uh, medicinal therapies are required. There are two different types of hormone replacement therapy. There are the traditional allopathic hormone replacement therapies of uh, patches, pills, um, and gels, which are um, typically estradiol and um, 
oral progesterone or um, some other forms of transdermal um, synthetic progestins. And then um, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy typically refers to estradiol replacement along with perhaps other hormone support. Because remem remember, women are just not made of estradiol, right? We, a lot of times in our allopathic world, think of um, menopause just leads to lower estradiol levels, and it's much more complex than that. We were just talking a little bit earlier that perimenopause is what we call an estrogen dominant type of uh, time in a woman's life. But the more um, uh, 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 bioidentical forms of hormone replacement therapy not support not only estradiol, but also DHEA, testosterone, androgens, maybe thyroid support, and also natural progesterone. So it allows us to tailor that hormone support a little bit um, uh, in a more personalized type of fashion. And of course, hormones are very personal and different in everyone. So that's why that's often a good fit. And here's the advice I give my patients, Elizabeth, and see if you agree with this. I always think that we should start with the minimum because hormones are very subtle and they're in very subtle feedback systems. Um, and so anything particularly sledgehammery usually causes other side effects. So um, Chinese herbal medicine has a long history of treating hormonal imbalances and particularly menopause. There's a whole specialty in menopausal medicine in Chinese medicine. So I always start with Chinese herbs, which are tailored to um, uh, your pattern. They're not tailored to your blood work results, but they're tailored to your symptom pattern. And they're very easily tweaked. At Unova, we make a special herbal formula for every patient, and we can just modify it as you change, which you do. Uh, obviously, menopause is a transition, so you really do change your hormonal picture. So I always think you should start there and lifestyle modifications. And it's amazing how much you can get done like that and then go on to bioidentical hormones and see someone like Elizabeth who's really tailoring them to you and then as a real last resort don't you think the, the I think you know hormones. it's very interesting because what you're describing is support of the body and in allopathic medicine we use that term HRT or hormone replacement therapy that word replacement is actually harsh in itself, right, I think. And that's why in our practice, we usually, I refer to this as a hormonal supportive therapy, right? So supportive therapy can be herbal therapy, acupuncture can be um, more subtle types of tweaking of the hormone balance. And I think that starting with those lifestyle measures first is always best, actually. I think, you know, looking at nutrition, looking at herbal, su herbal supplementation, looking at any type of uh, nutritional supplementation, and, and really working with nutrition, exercise, stress management, these are, I think, really great starting places when a woman starts to transition through perimenopause, not before menopause, but perimenopause. And, um, and those will just help your general overall health anyways. The, the, many of these maneuvers are gonna decrease inflammation in the body, which are gonna improve your body to function better overall anyway. So I look at perimenopause and menopause as a time, which is an exciting time in a woman's health life actually, that she can really grab a hold of her health, right? And really support the body through different maneuvers and always starting with those more natural maneuvers or those more supportive maneuvers first. Completely agree with you on that one. And you know, in Chinese medicine, it's always said that when you're going through a transformation, you do have the chance to sort of start again. At yeah. puberty, um, uh, uh, after pregnancy, uh, it, it's a time to reset. Uh, and so I'm really glad you said that. I wanted to ask you a little bit that it often preys on my patients' minds, which is um, the risk of giving people estrogen and then um, um, promoting breast cancer. And um, I... Uh, have a theory um, that is just anecdotal, but I think that the people who are most at risk are the people who were estrogen dominant in perimenopause. And I know there was a big study when HRT was ubiquitous and they had to cancel the study because women were getting breast cancer. And I think if they had been weeded out for the people who had gone into menopause in a very estrogen dominant state and then had low estrogen. And if you remember, it was so ubiquitous at one point, the GPs were handing it out without any knowledge, really. It had, it had sort of lost control. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was everywhere. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. So I love that word estrogen dominant. So, so functioning between the allopathic world or Western medicine and the more integrative world, 
that term estrogen dominant is so descriptive and I love that term, but if you Google estrogen dominant, right, you're gonna see it all over Google. If you PubMed or put into our allopathic peer reviewed literature, that term never comes up actually. It's, there's one paper in the literature that I found a, a couple of months ago that refers to the term estrogen dominant. But it's a really great descriptive term. It, it actually, it, it implies there's a hormone imbalance. And then actually looking at women, there are certainly women who are estrogen dominant and have a higher risk of breast cancer, a higher risk of uterine cancer, a higher risk of estrogen dependent kind of illnesses and diseases. And you see this and you can see, you, you, and I have patients in my practice who are clearly estrogen dominant based on the types of problems that they develop. So the Women's Health Initiative study had so many problems to start out with. The first problem was it used an estrogen that we, we use somewhat now, I mean, Premarin, and, but it uses a synthetic progesterone, Provera, which we don't use so much anymore. We, we favor more natural, more natural progestins. The, really, the jury is really out now, though, in terms of are more natural progestins safer for a woman? So something like Prometrium or oral progesterone or transdermal progesterone. There was a small study that came out from the UK that suggested maybe they're not safer, but they haven't really been well studied the same way as our synthetic progestins have been studied. But you're completely right. I mean, everybody has a different hormonal milieu. Everybody has a different hormonal balance, right? And so this is where we have to really look at really highly individualized medicine. And it would be nice to risk stratify to stratify risk stratify an individual or um, uh, who comes to us in terms of you know what is their hormonal milieu and definitely we see women who are definitely estrogen dominant they may um, be a little bit heavier or they may even they, they, they might not even be heavier but they may just have more estrogen out of out of out of proportion to progestins and I think that's important and that brings back what is your proper what is what how did your body function the best you know I always look at um, um, gasoline, right? There, in, and there's like, you know, there's a limited number of cars, but there's all sorts of different gas you can put in your cars. So there's all sorts of different oils that you can put in your, in your cars. There's more oils to run a car engine than there are estrogens to, to support women's health, which I think is interesting. Where, so we're all very, very different and we all have to be, I think, treated in a different fashion. And hormones are a delicate balance. And there's also an interplay between thyroid, adrenal glands, ovaries. So we can't look at just one isolated, you know, uh, uh, one isolated hormone in a woman, estradiol, we need to look at the whole picture. So I do think that that's really, really important. And Elizabeth and I are often on the same page. We've known each other for many years and we're often on the same page. We often say that. We don't get together all that often, but when we do, we talk and talk, don't we? Um, however, um, in Chinese medicine, we're saying the same thing, that you have your own personal pattern of disharmony. And um, anyone who can take the time to really diagnose that pattern is going to help you personally better. And I did want to just clarify by estrogen dominance for people who don't know what I mean by that. Um, uh, it, it doesn't mean that you have necessarily very high estrogen. It just means that sometimes as we get older, particularly, we have higher estrogen in relation to progesterone than we should. And often in perimenopause, a lot of those symptoms that people have of weight gain and um, slight depression and anxiety actually get helped by, um, we can do it with Chinese herbs and um, a, a little bit of progesterone cream, which I, in full disclosure, because Dr. Pointer is my doctor, she gave me when I was in perimenopause and it worked like a charm a tiny little bit of progesterone cream every day and um, I felt like myself again and so sometimes it's very subtle isn't it but that's just um, tipping the balance back between estrogen and progesterone and what it looks like when you're a bit estrogen dominant is the, uh, the warning signs I hear are breast tenderness fibrocystic breasts um, the really irregular periods with heavy periods clotted periods lots of PMS. Some women suddenly start to have PMS from ovulation until they get their period, which is misery um, uh, and that kind of thing. So, um, and weight gain uh, in perimenopause. And often that isn't your estrogen going down. That's actually your progesterone being low in relation to estrogen. And we have Chinese herbs we call yang tonics, which we give. Uh, but sometimes if that's not doing the trick, a tiny little bit of progesterone cream can, can't it, Elizabeth? And we also see the, you know, we see the surrogate markers of that too. You described a very nice description of uh, the physiologic aspects of it, but the surrogate markers, women's fibroids will grow during kind of perimenopause when they're estrogen dominant. Um, men, uh, endometriosis may also crop up at the first time during menopause 
and hyperplasias or precancers of the uterus, which actually are an indicator of a hormone imbalance, will also crop up at the time of perimenopause. So I actually think it's time for the allopathic world to adopt that term estrogen dominance, actually, from, from the more integrated people, actually. I think it would help them sort out a few people who need to be handled differently and, and monitored differently yeah. as they go through menopause, including being monitored differently for reproductive cancers, okay. um, because they have a, um, a higher incidence. Uh, if we're not careful. Emma, we're ready for another question. What would you like to ask us on behalf of the Innova community and the Electra community? Yeah, actually, so we've been speaking about estrogen dominance, but I wanted to, someone had asked about low estrogen levels and they were yeah. wondering about um, natural remedies for managing low estrogen and what are some ways to enhance vaginal health? I'll go first while you think, because yours will be more, <laughs> more technical. Um, so we give a category of herbs called yin and blood tonics for low estrogen. Um, things like, some of them are very common and you'll have heard of, um, like donggui, which um, um, donggui root, angelica root, is um, used in cooking in Chinese medicine and um, uh, women will put it in their food. They'll, they'll stew it up in their food uh, in order to help with estrogen levels as they get towards menopause they also use it for menstrual cramps uh, and things like that it's an amazing gynecological herb so i would give someone a formula for that um, and depending on where they are if they're still getting regular periods if they've got low estrogen in perimenopause i give two separate formulas one for the first half of the cycle one for the second trying to support the follicle in the first half so that it releases uh, when it becomes the follicle around the egg becomes what's called the corpus luteum and it releases progesterone after um, uh, you've ovulated. And so I support that first and then I support progesterone afterwards. But the things that you can do at home, which honestly make a huge difference because hormone imbalances are often very subtle, are eat seeds for a start. <laughs> a lot of the yin tonics in Chinese medicine, and you've got to think they knew this thousands of years ago before they knew what estrogen was, but they worked it, they reverse engineered it by what's called empirical evidence. They, they watched the effect it had on women. Um, so we use flax seeds, we use sesame seeds um, particularly, and I always tell my patients that seeds have beautiful oils in, and they kind of hydrate you from the inside out. They're anti-inflammatory, and they hydrate you from the inside out. It's important to have enough B vitamins, because that's a precursor to estrogen. And vitamin D, which functions a little bit like a hormone in the body and plays a role in estrogen synthesis, is also a good idea. I don't know what Elizabeth thinks of boron, but um, it seems to influence estrogen receptors and allow you to use your estrogen more, more often or more easily. And then there's also um, uh, black cohosh, which um, people always talk about, um, which stimulates estrogen receptor sites. So um, if you were doing it at home, seeds and vitamin D and vitamin B would be my first go to and then possibly boron and black cohosh or come and see us uh, or someone like us a herbalist and get a specially tailored formula to you which is better but you know you can you can start at home i think what do you think elizabeth um, i love seed cycling i have <laughs> a lot of i'm probably the only gyn oncologist who knows about seed cycling in this country um but we 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 send patients to you to talk about herbs and seed cycling and such but you know starting with a great healthy diet and then in the allopathic world we we, be, we tend to manage symptoms right we're, we're symptom oriented you guys support the body we are more symptom oriented so we'll for symptoms of um low estrogen we'll maybe hot flashes so we'll use uh pollen extracts for hot flashes some vitamins b vitamins magnesium things like this supporting with a great healthy diet an anti-inflammatory diet Diet, rich in you know the rainbow of fruits and vegetables, avoiding alcohol, caffeine, um, or even looking at um, bones. Boron may be helpful for bones. The question mark with uh, boron and estrogen and bones. Um, which, um, um, and then vaginal dryness is a symptom of low estrogen, right? So we'll work with topical hyaluronic acids, um, phytoestrogens for vaginal health, maybe laser for vaginal health for women who can't use estrogens, and, and but a lot of hyaluronic acid. So I think where you look to support the body in terms of the symptoms of low, uh, uh, where you look to support the body with low estrogen, we look more and target more the symptoms of how to, how to treat those, the symptoms of lower estrogen. But it's love, we fit together. Yeah, love seed cycling. <laughs> People who yes, when she refers to seed cycling, there's yeah. a way of using different seeds at different points in the cycle to um, support. You use four different seed, um, seeds for four different 
parts of the cycle. We do it a lot with our fertility patients, actually. So I did want to mention that acupuncture is awesome for hot flashes. And there have been plenty of clinical studies that show it. In fact, there was one, I think, in 2014 that showed that acupuncture in comparison to sham acupuncture, which is always controversial, um, uh, was way better for hot flashes. And that the um, after a course of weekly acupuncture, the effects lasted for several months. So it, it wasn't just a Band-Aid on the hot flashes while it was being done. It was actually changing uh, body chemistry. And so it's I think also that's and important to mention also exercise, right? I mean, oh. exercise, uh, you know, we actually ha now have an exercise physiologist in our practice. And uh, because exercise will, you know, supports the immune system, may help with hot flashes. So we're doing a lot of work now with, you know, prescriptions for restorative exercise, actually. That's a, that's a great idea. And I wanted to just pick up on vaginal dryness because it's a genuine problem. And while we have Elizabeth here, we should, we should talk more about it. Um, I usually, I, I, I hydrate people from the inside out with yin tonics. I use acupuncture to sort of promote circulation. Um, and there is a really good study on sea buckthorn oil and vaginal dryness, not topically, um, taken um, internally, that um, seems to help a lot. And I have a sort of use it or lose it attitude to vaginal atrophy. I think you, you need to exercise the area. You need to have sex either with your partner or on your own, but you need to get blood moving through there um, uh, is really helpful. And it's worth mentioning omega-3 fatty acids, which are, um, seem to be very helpful for vaginal dryness and vitamin E and um, vitamin A actually um, is also helpful. So there's lots of things out there and then you can use, um, there are nice natural lubricants out there. Don't use ones with perfumes and phthalates in because they cause inflammation and we're trying to get you uninflamed. Uh, Sliquid is a good one. The patients tell me <laughs> almost naked is another natural one. It's vegan and it's natural and silk do one with, ki it's, I think it's made from kiwi vine extract. Um, as a lubricant. So those are a, a good place to start as well. Um, but there's also, you can put um, topical estrogen creams and things like that, can't you, Elizabeth? And get quite right. a long way with that. So, right. So I'll put a plug in for my hyaluronic acid aloe vera gel, actually made nice. beneficial. And then one thing that I'm surprised we haven't really touched upon yet is microbiome, actually, because yeah. the gut microbiome is really important for the for metabolism of estrogen, right? When we talk about estrogen dominance, right? Yeah. How do we control estrogen dominance? We control through exposure to estrogens, but also metabolism of estrogens, right? But now there's some, what we've started doing in the practice, and now there's some data, is really looking at the vaginal microbiome as women age, actually, because as we lose estrogen, that vaginal microbiome actually changes. And just as the gut microbiome is really important, so is the vaginal microbiome. So we actually are beginning to really work with bringing, as women age and have problems with vaginal dryness, what happens is the pH of the vagina, which is normally very acidic, actually goes up, and then you can get an itis from it or an irritation when that pH goes up. So we're really starting to work with methods to bring the pH of the vagina down and repopulate with good bacteria, because as women lose estrogen, the pH goes up and the good bacteria goes down. And so we need that good bacteria. So we you know, many times we'll work with oral probiotics along with a healthy diet with good prebiotics and probiotics, but also with vaginal probiotics and, and bringing that vaginal pH down. So that's something that's a little bit more integrative that we're working with and having some good success with. And then of course, there's the topical estrogen creams. There's, uh, there's a lot of work now going on with DHEA. Actually, there's um, DHEA receptors in the vagina and the vulva. And so for women who may have recalcitrant vaginal dryness issues or vaginal pain issues or painful intercourse with just topical vaginal estrogen will actually work a lot with DHEA or DHEA combined with estrogens now also. And then there's that really allopathic thing that we do, um, you know, the CO2 Mona Lisa laser that for, you know, some well-selected individuals may be actually really beneficial. And for well-selected people, it can be actually a home run for them. Also, use it or lose it for our women who have significant um, vaginal atrophy. Uh, pelvic floor therapy will increase the blood flow to the vagina. Using dilators, really important to help pre uh, prevent any type of stricture of the vagina. The one thing that's so interesting to me with them um, vaginal atrophy is people still don't talk about it enough. I mean, I have uh, even some of my friends who come in and say, nobody told me that I was going to have painful intercourse. And we need to really have a dialogue with people and with our patients as physicians asking them about painful intercourse and vaginal dryness on a regular basis, which we do in our practice or try to. Yes. Well, I think it's because it's a horrible term. 
I, you don't want to think about that. We, we need a new term. Atrophy. Yeah, atrophy is not a good, good. Term. I know. Thinning, uh, atrophy. I, yeah, yes. I, know. I, I mean, you know, I don't know. Inflammation and irritation. Yeah, yeah. We, that's usually, I think of a better term. I know. Nobody wants to no, think it's, about it's their good. vagina, atrophy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but you do not need to suffer. This is what we're trying to tell you. There are lots of solutions and, and a different combination will work for you um, uh, than your friend, say. Uh, so persevere a, a little bit. I love the thought of uh, vaginal probiotics. I think that's genius. And I like the thought of the um, hyaluronic acid and um, aloe. You have, you have that in your office, do you? Right, we have like this uh, great magic combination of, of the you know, hyaluronic acid and, and, and with aloe. And, yes. and it's interesting because aloe alone will help very many women and hyaluronic acid alone will help, you know, in other carriers will help women. But I think that combination of the hyaluronic acid and aloe actually is really, really, really beneficial. I bet it's good because yeah. hyaluronic acid pulls moisture into the tissue. <laughs> Um, in, a, in a really impressive way. So I could imagine combining it with aloe, which contains a lot of moisture in its molecule. I could imagine it sort of pulling the moisture in in a really good way. And then you add to that local uh, uh, probiotics and um, uh, 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 ones for your diet too. And I bet you've, you've solving a lot of problems. I can see that. I'm enthusiastic. We, need to study, we actually need to study it. You know, we need to look yeah. at it scientifically yeah. it seems to but work. a lot of medicine is clinicians like you and i solving things on the ground isn't it we our patients right. come to us with problems and we're like okay <laughs> we will work this out for you <laughs> yes we well you mentioned dhea and i know emma has another question but dhea is something that my patients get confused about is it safe to take it should they take it should they be taking it for years on end um uh and if they are should they be a lot of people start taking it because you can buy it over the counter and then they never have their levels measured. So they don't really necessarily know whether they should be taking it or not. So I wondered if you would mind just talking a little bit about DHEA. DHEA is one of the adrenal hormones that actually begins to decline actually with age or, or some people just have some lower DHEA levels. Actually, we've noticed actually during COVID that everybody's testosterone and, and testosterone levels and DHEA are um, are very low actually because of I think some of the stressors that are going on. So when we have constant stress, it suppresses our adrenal glands. So DHEA, DHEA sulfate are important hormones in the body, and they um, they're androgenic, um, meaning they keep good good ma body mass on us, may help us with energy and such. Um, when we begin to do when we begin to talk about supplementation, though, you have to remember that DHEA gets converted to estradiol in the, in the body. And so women who may be at risk of, of estrogen dependent malignancies have to be careful or who have an estrogen dependent malignancy really should really be very careful about DHEA supplementation and that should be very highly individualized. But it is, a, it is, it is also associated with libido, like one of, you, um, one of the estrogen deprivation um, symptoms is lower libido and DHEA does, there's some data in the literature now that supports the use of DHEA for libido. So, but, but definitely when you're, when you're, when you're su supplementing something that's hormonal, which it is, um, the end level should be checked. You shouldn't just go out and bottle, buy a bottle of DHEA of 10, 25 milligrams and take it. It should be it should be monitored and followed and, and done in a responsible type of fashion. And just because you can buy something at the local health food store doesn't mean that it's safe. You know, we don't really talk it about that. Not. It has to be I'm a herbalist and I spend my life taking people off things. They arrive yeah. with carrier bags full and I yeah. sort of rationalize it into something yeah. that is you yeah. know, is a cocktail we understand rather than big. The other thing is people take a lot of things that, um, uh, together that we don't necessarily understand um, how they're in, interacting. And when it comes to your hormones, that that is a worry. So um, I, I take people off things and try and simplify their regimens. Emma, do you have another question? I do. I have some other questions that were submitted beforehand, but we actually got one in that um, might be a helpful segue into some other ones in terms of preparing for menopause. Yeah. So the question was, when you start skipping periods, does that mean that you will cease to menstruate soon afterwards? Is that a sign? Not necessarily is the answer. Um, uh, it depends on your age and um, uh, you, you might want to check what age your mum went through menopause because it often follows in families. Um, but um, actually sometimes my fertility patients who are still trying to get pregnant miss periods and get extremely alarmed that they're going into uh, menopause. And I have to reassure them that it's, it's, not, it's not usually like that. You don't just stop 
It does occasionally happen, but it's not usually like that. Um, so we have to decide why you're missing periods. But it is true that in the years, and I can speak from experience here, in the years before menopause, your, your periods become, your cycle becomes irregular. And if it becomes irregular in a way that is causing you um, uh, discomfort, um, then we intervene. Um, uh, so, you know, some people suddenly start getting a period every two weeks and feel like they're always on their period. Clearly that's suboptimal and we will help you. Um, some people go long periods of time without a period and our worry about that is that your um, um, uh, it's taking ages and ages to um, um, ovulate and your uterine lining is building up over time. And um, so we usually like you to have a period if you're, you know, if you're having these irregular periods. Um, what, what do you think, Elizabeth? I think, right. I think it's always important. And I, this happens m m many times in our practice, you know, a, a woman who may be in that perimenopausal age range, right? 43 on, right, starts to miss periods. And, and the assumption is, oh, you're menopausal, you know, you're perimenopausal, your estrogen levels are low. And we always, I always check thyroid function tests because, you know, hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism are, are, can lead to skip periods. Prolactin, small pituitary microadenomas may actually lead to, to miss periods. So it's always important when you start to miss periods, no matter kind of what age you're at, to really look into why that's occurring, even when you're perimen when you're in that perimenopausal age range. Because you know, we've I've had a couple of people who were sent to me just specifically for hormone replacement therapy, who, you know, we just checked values. And the FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, which is the pituitary hormone that drives the ovaries, which should be elevated when your ovaries are starting to fail or go through another bad word, atrophy and fail. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but when your ovaries start to change. Um, and um, and but it's always, always important to check that FSH, to check the thyroid, to check prolactin levels, to look for other reasons why you might be missing periods. So it's not always perimenopause, it could be something else. And, or, and just stress can also, you know, hypothalamic amenorrhea or missing periods can be due to stress. And we're seeing a lot of people miss their periods during COVID, actually, again, the, the country's very stressful and people's lives are stressful uh, and their jobs and um, people are at home looking after kids, homeschooling and juggling their jobs. I mean, it's a recipe for this. So we're, we're seeing, you know, I'm treating a lot of irregular menses um, virtually. Um, so uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that you're going into menopause necessarily. Right. And Elizabeth's right, we should, we should check, we should get to the bottom of things. What else, Emma? Um, okay, great. So we had, um, thank you for that, was really um, helpful and interesting to listen to. Um, we had quite a few questions. And I don't want to, I'm hesitant to umbrella them, but I wondered if maybe um, we could address a wide range of, um, of this, but uh, there were a lot of questions about food and diet and also weight. So maybe um, if you both could share your advice or thoughts on food and diet and weight management, maybe both in the lead up to menopause and throughout, I don't know if that's too much of an umbrella, but there are a lot of questions. No, that actually, it's, it, it's not at all. And the first thing, um, sadly, is that as we get older, we don't metabolize alcohol very well, women. Um, and um, so, um, you know, your, your body, your liver is, is a real sort of multitasker <laughs> and it gives up on the things that aren't quite as important, I think, if it gets distracted. And one of its smaller tasks, but an important one, is to uptake excess estrogen so you don't have um, too much estrogen in your blood. Um, and the other way that you get rid of excess estrogen is through your stool. So if you're constipated, um, uh, your, your stool sits there, your body takes water out of it, takes the estrogen with it, and you end up with more estrogen going back into your bloodstream. So looking after your liver is really important, which means moderating alcohol. I, when I sort of hit perimenopause, gave up alcohol, but uh, you don't have to do that. You don't have to be quite that strict. But um, four alcohol-free nights a week, I think, is not a bad idea um, if, if that doesn't feel too draconian. Um, and um, do things that look after your liver, uh, particularly leafy green vegetables and the cruciferous vegetables particularly have a, a phytonutrient in, um, which I will refer to as DIM because its long name is a very long name. Um, 
um, uh, which helps your body metabolize estrogen. So lots of leafy greens, lots of healthy fats. Um, the Mediterranean diet in studies has proved to be the best diet for um, uh, menopause. Um, the Asian diet isn't far behind because of all their, um, the way they eat soy, which is they don't overeat soy. And I do want to say that things like tofu and soy milk, um, uh, it's too much soy. And that's when it becomes controversial and there starts to be these um, discussions about whether it's causing breast cancer or not causing breast cancer or protecting you. In Asia, they eat a little bit of tofu with lots of veggies, um, not a venti to uh, soy latte or something like that. Um, but the I always advise my patients to look at the Mediterranean diet, lots of fish, think hydrating from the inside, lots of fish, lots of healthy fats, lots of colorful fruits and vegetables, low on the carbs, but not you know, not no carbs, but whole grains where you can, so that you get your bowel moving, plenty of fiber so that you're moving um, your stool through, um, and exercise, weight-bearing exercise. It's like you need to train for menopause in some ways. What do you think, Elizabeth? I think so. I think it's, you know, I think um, uh, it's interesting because one of the first harbingers of perimenopause are one of the first symptoms before people even start missing start missing periods in my practice is what's going on with my midsection you know it's like they'll 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 say like I'm, I'm putting weight on in my midsection right and and we know that as estrogen declines it actually um, increases our insulin resistance so we don't metabolize carbohydrates the same way and there's these super elegant studies that I just want to mention because you know people used to doctors used to say to women oh yeah it's just your age don't worry about it you can't do anything about it but there's this great set of um, experiments that were so so elegant actually you take a, a, a mouse and you do a sham operation. So you just operate on the mouse. You don't do anything. You open and close it. Then you do a mouse and you take, you take out his ovaries in that operation. The mouse in which the ovaries come out, estrogen goes down, and the mouse gets fat, actually gains weight. And then if you do a second series of experiments where you have a sham operation, a mouse with its ovaries out, who gets weight, who gains weight afterwards. But then you have a mouse where you start to change its diet and put protein in, in, in at a higher level than compared to carbohydrates, that mouse doesn't gain weight. So, so there's a metabolic basis. There's, there's, you know, we know that when we lose estrogen, we become more insulin resistant. So we don't metabolize our carbohydrates the same way. And our cholesterol also goes up. So our hemoglobin A1C may go up, which is a measure of glucose, um, a glucose stability in the blood and cholesterol may go up. So there's real metabolic changes that occur. So a Mediterranean diet, great diet, actually anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet, um, rich in complex carbohydrates, plant-based, great, phy great phytonutrients, but really paying attention to also good protein is really important, like good high quality protein is super important. And also beginning to shift that, uh, that curve a little bit in terms of maybe you're gonna eat fewer carbs and a little bit more protein in your diet. And again, that's really highly individualized. People are like, well, this is the menopause diet, you know, for, you know, you should do X, Y, and Z. It's gonna be different for everybody. And everybody's gonna have to change their nutrition just a little bit as they go through perimenopause and menopause to, to, to keep a healthy weight and a healthy metabolism. Thank you. That was that was helpful, I think. I noticed we had a question, just a quick one from Laura, asking, are Chinese herbs appropriate for women with a history of hormone-positive breast cancer? And yes, they are certain Chinese herbs, though, Laura. So you need to see a herbalist. We know which of our herbs are estrogenic. We're very careful, actually. Um, but don't take things over the counter. Um, see someone who knows what they're doing. But yes, in fact, they can be useful to prevent recurrence. There's, a, you know, there's a lot we can do. Chinese herbology is a very sophisticated system of herbology. It's never just one herb. Like we never use one herb. Like you see in Western herbology, things like St. John's work for depression. We don't do that. We practice what's called polypharmacy and we make a separate herbal formula for every patient that is unique to you. Um, and it's the fun of our job. It's like being at Hogwarts. We like mix things <laughs> and <laughs> until we get you in a bottle and then we give it to you. So um, uh, we can um, we can prescribe with um, your a breast cancer diagnosis in mind uh, and do it very safely. And uh, you know, but where hormones are what we do, we're confident about that. That's that's one of our areas. We do understand the herbs we prescribe. Now, Emma, what else do we have? 
Um, so we had another question, um, which was a little more specific, and it was, if you have your ovaries removed before menopause as a preventative measure for ovarian cancer, what would you recommend doing in preparation? Well, I'm going to have Elizabeth answer that first, because she's a surgeon as well as... Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, um, yeah, we end up doing a lot of this type of surgery, fortunately or unfortunately, fortunately, because we get to prevent disease, right? So... So I always, I always think that women need to be prepared, and this is one of my longest consultations in my practice, actually, is preparing to remove your ovaries. Because I think if you're well-educated going in in terms of what are the symptoms and side effects of removing your ovaries, and then what is your strategy afterwards? Are you going to go on allopathic hormone replacement therapy? Or is there a contraindication to that? Are you gonna go on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy? And then also looking at your specific health history and your family health history, because you have to look at what happens when the ovaries come out. It's not only hot flashes and mood issues, which can be very highly significant mood issues with depression, anxiety. So looking at your personal health history, looking at your cardiac history, because like I, like I mentioned before, cholesterol is gonna go up, that balance is gonna shift when your ovaries come out, bone loss is gonna be a potential problem. So I will actually get a baseline bone density on my patients before I remove ovaries. But having individuals really well prepared and having a game plan, because the worst thing with taking out somebody's ovaries and then not having a plan for how you're going to handle this afterwards is, is really can be very devastating, obviously, for women and very difficult. So I think how do you prepare? You have a game plan for how you're going to manage your symptoms or your health after the ovaries are removed. And, you know, for women who have a prior history of breast cancer, you know, these, these individuals can't have hormone replacement therapy generally on the East Coast. West Coast may be a little bit different. But if you don't have a personal history of cancer, you know, you, you, you may, everybody's different. You may be a candidate for hormone replacement therapy afterwards. And then the question is, are you going to start it? When are you going to start it? How are you going to start it? Or, you know, seeing somebody like Jill beforehand, you know, getting the body actually primed and prepared for surgery. And then afterwards going in for intensive herbal therapies and acupuncture. But I think the most important thing is how do you prepare? You prepare, you talk to your surgeon, if they're going to help you with the symptoms and, and, and side effects and in your ongoing midlife or your ongoing health afterwards, or you engage somebody to help you with that. In our practice, you know, I'll, I'll actually see people for other surgeon, from other surgeons, you know, just so we can help manage the, the, the issues after an oophorectomy or, uh, you know, afterwards, just so women have a, a, a plan moving forwards afterwards. And I, I, I agree. I start with a plan with people. Um, and I think it's really important that you have a doctor and a healthcare team that you can talk to. Um, and and we'll hear you and we'll keep modifying um, the plan. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, I, I think, I, and so part of preparing is get, get yourself a team of people who you can rely on um, um, to listen to you um, and react to your symptoms. You shouldn't have to suffer. It may take a, a few weeks to get everything settled down, um, but um, there, there is a way through. And I've seen people do this, and you must be the same, Elizabeth, very successfully, actually. Absolutely. Yes. And sometimes if you're very young, when you're taking out your ovaries, you may need a little creativity because remember, women are just not estradiol, right? Our ovaries, you know, where they are linked to androgen production, DHEA production, so testosterone and DHEA production, as well as estradiol and progesterone. You know, we in the allopathic world think, oh, you don't need any progesterone if you don't have a uterus in place. So if you take out your uterus, you don't necessarily need progesterone in our in our in our allopathic world. But progesterone actually does provide us with a little bit of level of of, of calmness, of somnolence in the evening. So so there's all sorts of different ways to to, um, to replace hormones, highly individualized. So you just get somebody engaged. Best plan is to get somebody engaged with your care that you can talk to who's going to be in it with you for the long haul also. That's a good answer. And um, we had another question, which is, what if you were on BCP, uh, low estrogen, for a number of years going into perimenopause? How will this affect the transition into menopause? Oh, it, so you were on the birth control pill for a number of years going into perimenopause and how does it affect the transition and um, uh, particularly on the birth control pill, a low estrogen birth control pill? I think that's, um, I'm going to let you go first and then I will carry on, Elizabeth. So, you know, some people like to use the birth control pill right through the transition of perimenopause. 
I'm not a huge fan of that actually, because your risk of breast cancer is elevated while you're on a birth control pill. And as women are aging, that's our, our the biggest risk factor for breast cancer is actually age, right? It's like the, so, so as we age, our risk of breast cancer goes up. So I'm not a huge fan of, of transitioning women all the way through menopause with a birth control pill. That being said, the question when you come off of a birth control pill, you know, women are used to this very many times, this very stable, monotonous monotonous level of hormones and then to have that cycle again may be jarring. You may have heavier bleeding than you had when you were on a birth control pill. You might have forgotten what it means to be in the second half of your cycle. But what so what we do when women come off of a birth control pill is we we you know we we take our, our patients off and then we see how you are and then we begin to support the body where you need to be supported. And also, you can also tell where you are in the menopause transition, actually, by when you're on the last day of your placebos, you can check an FSH. You can see, is your FSH super elevated? Then you know that you're gonna have some issues you know, with perimenopausal symptoms or menopausal symptoms coming off of the birth control pill. But we really play it by ear. So if I have a patient who's coming off of a birth control and transitioning off of a birth control pill, I'll do either a telehealth appointment or follow up somehow in a month, two months, and three months to see how, see how one is doing. Because I I think everybody responds a little bit differently. Some people say, you know, there's some women who are not responsive to hormones at all in terms of the fluctuations, right? They don't, they don't experience heavy bleeding or mood issues. And there's some of us, me included, who are like very, very, very responsive. And so these individuals may have some more issues transitioning off of a birth control pill. But there is support, natural and allopathic. I am, um, um, I agree. I don't, um, I'm not, a huge fan of being on the birth control pill all the way to menopause um, uh, and so um, often I help um, my patients transition off and I do just treat symptoms as they go and um, it, it's almost always sort out of all. It, it's often just a question of finding your rhythm again in some ways um, and so um, Chinese herbs are particularly good for things like heavy periods. We have um, hemostatic herbs that stop uh, the bleeding. We have all sorts of um, cool tricks. So that's um, uh, that's what I would do. I just noticed in the chat that Laura asked if we could define allopathic medicine, which is possibly a term that um, we use and isn't really commonly used. So what yeah, is allopathic right. medicine? Right. Uh, maybe I should say traditional Western medicine. Jill, you're <laughs> talking from Eastern. I'm talking from traditional Western yes. medicine. Yes. So allopathic medicine refers to that traditional Western medicine that is taught to us in medical schools, basically. Um, we um, not super integrative, not super holistic, more systems oriented, and uh, uh, but nonetheless, our traditional Western or Americanized medicine. And I always think that um, I, I love Western medicine and I use it myself. Elizabeth is my doctor, so there we go. And what I love about um, traditional medicine, um, conventional medicine, is the precision of diagnosis, which is what Elizabeth's talking about when she's doing blood levels and just you know tweaking um, hormones in order to get you to feel like yourself. The thing I think it misses out on is that, uh, and Elizabeth would agree with me here, um, is that um, your body has an extraordinary amount of intelligence. People always ask me, what's chi? And it sounds like such an amorphous concept. But what chi actually is, is your body's ability to communicate. Every cell in your body is receptive and active. It has yin and yang in Chinese medicine. It has the ability to know who it is in relation to other cells and the ability to act. And every organ system synchronizes and integrates what it's doing with other organ systems. And all of that is a very complex web of communication all of it happening outside of your mind because your body is smart enough to know that your mind could not handle this. If you had to remember to ovulate, you would forget or do it late <laughs> or something like that. And so, or breathe in fact. Um, but when you were born, you knew how to breathe, which is miraculous when you think about it. And you knew as an embryo how to grow yourself into a human being. There is an intelligence in the body that is really your chi. And I think what Chinese medicine does does, is um, uh, prompt that intelligence to work better. You know, we're all about trying to get your body's communication systems to work better, which means that we're good for long-term 
imbalances that are chronic. You wouldn't, if you were, you broke your leg, you wouldn't go and come and see us until well after you've been to the ER, you know, or you were having a heart attack. You wouldn't think, oh, I must call my acupuncturist immediately. You would not. You would get in an ambulance and go to the ER. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes you need surgery. And that you, your job is to, the body's intelligence will recover you after surgery. You know, the surgery doesn't heal you. The surgery takes the problem away and then you heal you uh, at the end of it. Um, and so I sort of live in the area where I'm constantly just tweaking and um, with the minimum I can to get the body's own intelligence to do what it knows how to do. And that's the stuff that we take for granted. If you have an extra couple of drinks at dinner, your liver kicks in and detoxifies. And as long as you don't do it you know, too often, you'll be fine. If you get a bug bite, you have a histamine reaction. Your body's very smart and it has solutions to most things. And it particularly has a solution to menopause because it's not necessarily pathology. We put pathologize menopause but actually we go through menopause it's a normal life transition and so your body does know how to regulate your hormones and really it's just a question of supporting you while you while your body recalibrates i think i completely agree i mean traditional western medicine we're great at putting band-aids on things we're really great at in and out maneuvers you know wonderful things have come out of traditional Western medicine, you know, cures for, you know, chronic illnesses, acute illnesses. Um, but sometimes we're not so good supporting the body. We slam the body actually, you know, and that's why sometimes these more subtle changes through acupuncture or more natural therapies may be actually more beneficial and more appropriate than through a medication, perhaps, if that can be safely done. Always important though, always to make sure that everything is being done as safely as possible. And that's why I was still working with somebody like yourself, complete trust, complete, you know, you always want to make sure that you're getting the right things done for your body in the safest fashion possibly. Yes. And, and you know what you want, I think, is uh, practitioners who talk to each other and refer to each other. I don't handle things that I don't think Chinese medicine can handle. <laughs> I send people, you know, I don't, um, for instance, if someone has an enormous fibroid, I know that Chinese herbs can reduce them a little bit. And we certainly, we can stop them bleeding. So if bleeding fibroids are the issue, we can often be helpful, but we're not going to make it magically disappear. And if you need that fibroid taken out, you need to see a gynecological surgeon like Dr. Poyner, and I would send you to one if you were my patient. And I think that's the important thing, you know, because sometimes your body can rectify things with a little prod, and sometimes it takes more than a little prod. It takes pharmaceuticals or surgery or, you know, something like that. But I think it's important to always retain the power on your side. You're not, your body does the healing, even if you take a pill. It's right. your body adjusting to the pill that does the healing. Um, it's your response to pharmaceuticals that, that's important. And um, I think sometimes um, um, medicine can be hard to understand and it can feel a bit disempowering. And so I very much like to, particularly when it comes to menopause, which is, let's face it, just something we all go through. Um, uh, I like to hand the power back a little bit and um, find ways of prompting your body to to get used to its new reality, which I have to tell you, everybody, that just before we came on, I told uh, Emma, I, when I went through menopause, it really wasn't that bad at all. <laughs> and so I, we should say that because we've made it all sound terrible. Uh, and, um, you know, hormone imbalances can have um, nasty side effects, but they're correctable. And a lot of people um, go through menopause with very minor symptoms and it's important before you all and emma's young i'm going to make you we're going to make you dread menopause it's really you know <laughs> dr pointer and i will be old by then and possibly gone but we will leave you instructions <laughs> i think i think one of the things that i would actually add to that i think a couple of things you know it's important that we all have mutual respect for each other as eastern and western practitioners right we need to have open minds because there are appropriate times for eastern medicine and appropriate times for western medicine and i think especially related to menopause we need to have the dialogue right we need to have you know women know what are these early warning 
warning symptoms or right? warning's a bad word that's like atrophy and failure but um but it, what are the early signs of menopause what what a, what what a woman might notice that she should bring to the attention of her eastern or western practitioner and some of that may be very subtle like i said like you know increased weight in the in the in the midline but also you know subtle symptoms of some mood issues and things like this and everything you know women should be aware and we should educate women to be aware of these early more subtle signs or symptoms it's not just i stopped a period. It's, it's much more and much more complex than that. Well, Emma, do you, we're almost at the end. Do you have... Um... I think that's a nice place for us to... Oh, <laughs> there might be one more question. Let me just check before I... Okay, if we could squeeze in one more question, but we do only have five more minutes left. Um, so really quickly before I read this out, I do want to just flag that um, we'll send a little recap email to everyone who joined us tonight and we'll give you more information on how to reach out to Jill and Dr. Pointer. Um, so the question is, is there any benefit to wait to treat perimenopause symptoms with HRT or bioidentical hormones um, until you are close to menopause or in menopause? I've heard once you reach menopause, you have less symptoms. I think that's going to be highly individualized. I think that if you're having symptoms which are altering, let's say, your quality of life, right? There are some women who have such problems with sleep or hot flashes that it really alters the quality of life. So I think that everybody's going to be a little bit different. I don't think that there's any advantage of waiting uh, and, and waiting to do hormone replacement therapy, right? Um, I think that if you if you are having symptoms, they should be they should be managed, and that may be nutrition, lifestyle, exercise. It may be Eastern medicine. And it may be more traditional hormone replacement therapy or bioidenticals. It, it, there's no there's no advantage of waiting. It's 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 how, these symptoms should be I think managed as they impact your quality of life. And that's a dialogue. That's why you need a, a practitioner who will have a conversation with you about how these symptoms may be impacting not only your quality of life but your overall health actually also. So no advantage to waiting necessarily if you're going to use hormone replacement therapy in the future. But that decision and that choice is going to be based on many complex factors. And we want you to be well. There is no reason for you to suffer. So you don't have to wait until you're really suffering at all. In fact, we'd rather you came in, wouldn't we, Dr. Pointer, when things were only a little out of balance and that they're much easier to put back than when everything's got rather extreme. Okay. You don't want yes. to, we want you to be And also well. there's women who are on HRT for just a brief period of time through that transition where those levels are going up and down or those receptors are going up and down. So, so, so again, treating the whole person, treating the symptoms. We don't want you to be unwell. And the message I think from both of us is start with the least intervention and work your way up. Um, you know, start with, um, it's amazing how much of a difference food, exercise, sleep, cutting back alcohol, giving up smoking um, can have. Um, and then Chinese herbs, acupuncture, really good for hot flashes um, and night sweats and things like that. And then um, up, up, you, you up it a little bit. Then the best thing you can do is see someone who will tailor your hormonal response uh, 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 like with bioidentical hormones, I think. And most of the people I know have have found solutions in that way. And then some people will need hormone replacement therapy at a sort of slightly higher level. And if you do, you do. We don't want you, you know, you have to function. I remember years ago, I was treating a Broadway actress and she would have a hot flash every night in the middle of her big number. Like if you can imagine the spotlight going on you and the audience having paid a fortune for Broadway tickets and you're just like sweating. <laughs> and she was like, Joel, we have to sort this out. And we did get it under control with acupuncture but there's no way that she was in her prime of her career. There's no way she could have a hot flash every night in the middle of her show, so. And this is why I think, you know, um, organizations such as Electra, right, of which I, which I work with, uh, you know, so important because, you know, you and I are here in New York, right? Like, you know, who do you talk to when you're in other parts of the country and other parts of the United States? And that's why it's nice that you do telehealth, Jill, and that Electra is here to a community of, of, for women and a, and, a, and a platform for women to review symptoms and review management options and strategies with, you know, with really well vetted practitioners on their, on their staff. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you both so much for all of your wisdom and insight. I found that really interesting. And I know there's comments coming in about um, saying the same thing. So thank you both so much for sharing your time with us this evening. 
Thank you. It's nice to see all your thank yous. Thank you. Natasha says that Unova is an essential part of her well-being. Thank you, Natasha. I love the Unova community. <laughs> <laughs> such a good community um it's been lovely to spend this time with you elizabeth it's been we've been on lockdown Thank i haven't you. seen you for ages i need to yeah. i need to come and visit you actually yeah. um emma i have a uh, even though we work for the same organization she is based in new york and i'm in upstate new york doing telehealth so i haven't seen her and it's lovely to see you all even though i can't see you but to hear your questions um so thank you for this discussion on menopause which i found interesting actually Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night. Take care. Bye.